Good morning. Welcome to uh, another day of LCA 2010. I'd like to introduce to you uh, Lindsay Holmwood, System uh, Administrator out of uh, Sydney. Don't hold that against him, please. Um, the he's going to part be... or, the, or the Sydney part? The, the Sydney part. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be talking to us today about uh, Flapjack and monitoring uh, for the cloud. So uh, please make him welcome. Thank you for the introduction. Um, hi, I'm uh, Lindsay Homewood, and I'm going to be talking about uh, Flapjack, which is all about rethinking monitoring for the cloud. You can follow me here on Twitter if you're interested. So before we start the talk, we probably want to sort out some terminology. Who here has used a monitoring system before in some way? Okay, so that's most people. So I'll skip through this pretty quickly. But we have a check, right, a concept of a check. And checks are all about verification and validation of some particular unit of a system, right? And developers call these unit tests, and we call these checks. And a check looks at a you know, very simple form, something like this. Obviously, it's going to be a tiny bit more complex, but in this particular example here, we're just pinging a machine four times, and that will give you a return code if something is bad. And it'll give you a good or a bad and ugly, so an exit zero, exit one, or exit two. Then we have the concept of a monitoring system. And what a monitoring system does is it constantly monitors for failing checks. And generally, it's got a big table of all the checks that it needs to execute. And it might do it sequentially, or it might do it in parallel. It really doesn't matter. So now that we're talking about monitoring systems, we have to think about the three questions, essentially, that all monitoring systems are asking. What's the next check that I need to perform? Was the check OK after I've executed it? And who do we notify? And the who can be either nobody or a list of people or whatever. So we've got these three questions that all monitoring systems are asking. And they basically map into these three distinct terms, which are a test, a, uh, sorry, fetch, and a test, and a notify phase, which looks something like this. It's just a big circle, right? Going around, fetching, testing, notifying. And within those steps, there are actually a couple of sub-steps where we're doing some sort of lookup in the fetch phase. Um, it might be from a database or it might be from a flat file. It doesn't really matter. In the testing phase, we are executing that check and verifying that it, how it executed. Uh, and then in the uh, notify phase, we're deciding who we need to notify or whether we need to notify at all. And we're calling out to a bunch of other systems to do that. So there might be SMS or email or what have you. And traditionally, monitoring systems have implemented this in more or less a single process model. Uh, it's all very monolithic. All this stuff is happening within a single process. There might be threads within a process that's doing it. Um, and for monitoring systems that distribute it, um, they're essentially just doing this within that and they have some sort of mechanism for talking to, uh, to other monitoring systems. And when we think about the problem in a very, in the very simple way that I've just laid out, uh, we actually realize that uh, in, the monitoring itself is what's called an embarrassingly parallel problem. And that's one for which little or no effort is required to separate the problem into a number of parallel tasks. And that's mainly because there's no dependency between the different bits within the monitoring system, right, if you look really closely. And the reason that is is because there's a bunch of common data that's passing around between all these different uh, phases of the system, right? So in the fetch and the test and the notify phase, we've got these two different bits of data. We've got the ID and the command that's going from the fetch phase uh, to the test phase. And then we have the ID and the result. And the ID is just some unique way of identifying that check, right? So what we can actually start doing is grouping the fetch and the test phase into just uh, a single transaction, right? You're just fetching and then testing in one shot. And then we can also start breaking this up into two separate life cycles where you also have another fetch and a notify phase. So then you've got these two cycles where um, they can run uh, either in the same process or they can run separate processes. They can run synchronously or asynchronously. Um, but, but fundamentally, they are two separate things that are happening within the same piece of software, right? And we have some sort of common communication mechanism for uh, sending data between these two processes, right? Because they need to talk to one another in some some reasonably simple way, but they do need some sort of communication mechanism. So now that we've done that, uh, we can think about some other fundamental things that we can change within monitoring systems, where 
we do things like pre-compilation of checks. So we basically have some process that uh, fetches all the checks that we might want to execute on your monitoring system at one point in time. And it will just pre-compile a big list of, you know, I need to run this ping check and this disk check and this other host up check and that sort of thing. Um, so whenever we need to do the fetch phase for the testing phase, um, uh, we can just get that really simply. It isn't a computationally expensive task, right? Uh, the other thing that we can think about is the transport as being the scheduler. So the transport is making um, those bits of data available to the other bits in the system um, whenever they need it. Uh, so that sort of vastly simplifies a lot of the architecture as well. Um, and then finally, uh, we can try and subscribe to the Unix philosophy of doing one thing and doing it well. And we do that by not doing any data collection within the monitoring system. So traditionally, a lot of monitoring systems like uh, Nargios and whatnot um, will uh, try and do a bit of data collection within the testing phase as well. And what we're saying is we should try and factor that out entirely so that we can just focus on one thing and doing that extremely well. So I've got these phases. And this is essentially how software that I've written called Flapjack works. We have a notifier and a worker, and they talk to one another uh, over a transport called Beanstalk, which acts as a scheduler. And then we also have a populator, which is doing that pre-compilation and injecting jobs onto uh, the Beanstalk D, which is basically a, uh, a work queue, a glorified work queue like uh, AMPQ or something of that nature. And then we can do other things like, OK, well, they're all talking over the network. Um, either locally or uh, you know, to a bunch of machines in the same data center or over different data centers. And it means that we can spin up as many workers as we want to cope with the number of checks that we have in the system. So all these different things, uh, the, the, uh, the testing phase of the monitoring lifecycle can be very, very easily parallelized so that we can uh, run up as many copies of the workers to execute as many checks as we want. And it doesn't affect uh, overall the scalability of uh, other, other parts of the system. And thus we have Flapjack. Flapjack is written in Ruby, um, and it aims to be uh, distributed, scalable, and I talked to the Nargios plugin format um, because there's not a lot of point in reinventing the wheel. So there are a couple of tenets that um, the Flapjack project tries to uphold. It should be easy to install, it should be easy to configure, easy to maintain, and it should be very, very easy to scale. And it should be just as easy to scale from one machine to lots of machines. So we'll go through some of the components of Flapjack and understand how they work and talk with one another. So fundamentally, we have this worker, notifier, and admin slash populator. But before we can go into that, we sort of need to understand why, how Beanstalk D fits into this whole thing um, and how uh, to, to aid communication and scheduling within, within the system. So Beanstalk D is a simple, fast work queue service that lets you run time-consuming tasks asynchronously. Um, and the thing to note here is that it's completely asynchronous. So it's not like something like Gearman, which is very uh, synchronous command and control style. Um, it's just uh, putting jobs on a queue somewhere, and then whenever you feel like it, you pop something off the queue and do something with it. And then you can put a result back or whatever. So there are some packages that I have for Ubuntu, and there are packages in the works for uh, Red Hat Enterprise and, um, and OpenBSD as well. So if you install it and then you run Beanstalk D here with this command. Um, what that's doing is it's starting up Beanstalk D as a daemon uh, on this host and this port. And I'll actually do that by default anyway, but just an example. So when you're writing client software to talk to Beanstalk D, uh, you have two different types of clients. You have producers and consumers, and people who've uh, had experience with some sort of messaging technology, this will be very, very familiar. So a producer uh, is in the first example up here, uh, what we're doing is we're saying this is the location of the beanstalk. Um, we're going to connect to it, and then we're going to put a job on the beanstalk, um, which is just a string called hello. And then down here on the consumer side, we're doing the same thing, connecting to the same beanstalk. And forever, in this big loop, um, we are reserving a job off the beanstalk here. So that's just saying, give me the next job. And that will actually block until the job becomes available to it. Uh, and then once it's got that job, it assigns it to this variable called job. And in this particular case, it's just uh, putting the contents of that job, which is just yielding that string hello. And then it's deleting that job off that queue. And this is fundamentally the way that Flapjack itself works. The workers and notifiers are just doing this. Obviously, there's a bit of extra infrastructure around it to verify that it's working the way that you expect it to. 
and a whole bunch of other funky features. Uh, and then you've got your admin and populator, which are the producers right there, the things that are injecting jobs onto the queue at particular points in time. So there are a couple of really cool Beanstalk features that make this very, very easy to build something like Flapjack. So when you boot up Beanstalk D here, uh, you have this concept of named tubes. Oh, that's dumb. I've got that line duplicated. Um, so what we can do is when we connect to the Beanstalk D, we don't have to, uh, by default when you connect, it just uh, connects to a tube called jobs. And a, a tube is the name of, it's basically uh, Beanstalk D's terminology for a queue. So in this particular case, we've got two cubes, sorry, cues slash tubes, where uh, we've got a checks tube and a results tube. And what they are is they're just named cues, basically. And we can pop stuff on the checks tube, and it won't be available on the results tube, and vice versa. Uh, the other cool thing about the Ruby API is that it has convenience methods for serializing Ruby data structures into the Beanstalk D itself. So very simple data structures, like you're not putting uh, you know, classes or anything like that. You're just putting hashes and, and arrays and that sort of thing. So the advantage of that is it means that we can deal with native data structures uh, within Ruby on either side of the Beanstalk, um, but it's transported in a common format, which in this particular case is YAML. And that's done using this yput method here. So now that we understand how Beanstalk D works and how that fits into everything else, uh, we're going to look at the Flapjack worker, which is sort of the workhorse of, of the whole system, right? So I like to explain the way that the worker works um, like the tale of the eternally forgetful shopper. So you have a shopper, and they're going to the shop, and they're going down the aisles, and they're looking for the thing that they want to buy, and they find it, and they go to the checkout, and they're walking back to the car after they paid, and they think, oh crap, I forgot something, I've got to go back. So they go back in, and they go down the aisles, and they find the thing they're looking for, go and check out, go back to the car, think, oh crap, I forgot another thing. And basically this whole thing just happens again and again and again, right? It's just a big loop. Yes. <laughs> um, the question was, clearly this person has mutable data, and the answer is yes. Uh, so this is essentially what the loop is doing within the worker, right? We are going to the checks queue and we're saying, give us the next check that needs to be executed. We sign it to this variable called check, then we're going to execute that, uh, the check command here, and then we'll strip out the return value of that so we can put it onto the results tube later on. And then in this results queue, uh, what we're doing is we're uh, putting um, uh, a new result onto the results tube and we're saying this is the check ID, this is the output, and this is the return value. Um, and the first step here is sort of, you know, walking into the shop. The second step here is finding a thing you're looking for. And this step here is going back to your car. And then we have this other step that my um, parable doesn't really cover, which is the checks queue where once we have finished doing something with that job, um, and after we put it on the results queue, we actually put it back onto the checks queue, but with an induced delay. And that's how the scheduling stuff works. We have this frequency option that we pass here when we put something back on the checks queue. And what that does is when it pops the check back onto the Beanstalk D, it actually sets a delay on it of, say, 30 seconds. So it executes the check, puts it back on with this delay, and then Beanstalk D won't make that job available, that, it won't make that check available to another worker for 30 seconds. So that's how we do scheduling within Beanstalk D. And then finally, we delete the check here at the end. And obviously, there's a race condition where um, you could potentially uh, put the check back onto the queue without deleting the old check. Um, but the worst thing that's, that's going to happen on your system is uh, you'll have a check duplicated. So we, that could be a problem if you have a, a very intensive check um, that's doing lots of you know, computation and whatnot, but um, there are ways of solving that problem. So this flapjack worker um, is very, very simple. It's just a command line utility. You start it up. It attaches to the terminal that you're currently running on. You can control C that, and you can also pass a bunch of options to the worker itself. Um, and the way that you're generally using the workers is not by invoking them one at a time. Um, you're using the worker manager, which handles booting up all these different workers and then just running them in the background. So on the first line here, we're starting up a worker, and by default, it's starting uh, five workers. Then we uh, start it up again with another 10 workers. And what that actually does is, the, so the first, for the first line, we're running five workers, and we run the second line. We're now running 15 workers, because it's five plus 10. And then we... Uh, 
when we run the stop command, it will stop all the workers that are currently running on the system. So it means it is very easy to uh, start up uh, a small number of workers and then scale that out as you find that your monitoring system isn't able to keep up with the number of checks that you're executing. The nice thing about this approach is that uh, because the worker is so simple, we can pretty much do linear scaling with the number of checks in your system. So a lot of monitoring systems like Nargios have problems once you start uh, getting above a certain number of checks within the system run. The nice thing about Flapjack is that you start getting too many checks in your system, you just spin up more workers, point them at the same beadstalk, and everything is fine. So the scaling is essentially linear. The other nice thing is failover. Because the checks themselves, the, sorry, the workers themselves are so simple, um, it's very easy to, let's say, uh, you want to do maintenance on part of your um, Flapjack worker cluster, right? Because you'll, you'll probably be running your Flapjack workers across a couple of different machines if you've got lots of checks. So uh, you want to take part of that cluster offline uh, to do some maintenance. So what you do is you uh, make sure that there are enough running on somewhere else, uh, or you start up a bunch of new uh, Flapjack workers on another machine, shut down all the other workers, the monitoring system keeps going, you do your maintenance, uh, and then once you finish your maintenance, you start, the, start up the Flapjack workers again, and everything is fine. And the monitoring system doesn't skip a beat, because the, everything is as asynchronous, right? So even if part of the cluster, or even if the entire cluster just disappears, uh, yes, you won't be processing checks and processing results, but um, you, haven't, you haven't completely failed. The next part of the system is the Flapjack notifier. And it works very, very similarly to uh, the worker in that you start it up and it runs on the current console. You can pass a bunch of options to it, and it actually has a few more options. Uh, the two ones that we care about are the recipients and the config file. So, uh, and, and like you would do with the, with the worker, you also have the notify manager. And generally, you're only really one, running one notifier because I can deal with the load quite, quite easily. But it's very easy to cluster um, Flapjack notifier like you would do uh, the Flapjack workers as well. So if we have a look at this recipients.conf here, it's a very simple any file. And uh, this is probably going to change. You're probably going to end up having to do, uh, later on when Flapjack starts maturing, you're going to have to do lookups in the database for all this sort of information. But this works, works for the time being. And in here, you provide a bunch of options. So you, you provide a bunch of details for somebody that you want to notify. And the nice thing about this is when uh, it comes to the notification phase of the monitoring system, um, it will just pass in this configuration to it, and then the notifier itself can just cherry pick the information out about it. So, you know, the, uh, the XMPP notifier for sending messages over Jabba um, only cares about the JID, so that's the only thing that it'll look at. But it makes, makes it very easy to build hybrid notifiers that care about all these different things, if you want. And then we have this notify.conf there. Hopefully you guys can see that. Okay. Um, and in this notify configuration, uh, on this line just over here, we're just saying we want to load up the mailer and the XMPP notifiers, uh, and they're running all the time. We also have this concept of persistence backend, and the persistence backend is, uh, is the way that we're serializing the checks out to disk somewhere um, so we can represent them in an admin system or a different sort of dashboard or whatever. Then we have the transports, which I'll talk about a tiny bit later, but the transport is basically Beanstalk, but there's an API that lets you write other transports if you want. Um, and then we have a notifier configuration directly for um, each of these notifiers that we mentioned up here, the mailer and the XMPP one. So this stuff is passed to the constructor of the notifier when the notifier is booting, but I'll cover that in a bit. It'll make a lot more sense. OK, um, probably the coolest feature about Flapjack, um, other than its massive scalability and its failover, is uh, its APIs in the notifier. This is really where the power of Flapjack starts coming out. So we provide, we provide uh, three different APIs. Um, actually, it's a lie. There's four different APIs. But there's three ones that you guys probably really care about, which are Notifier API, the Filters API, and the Persistence API. So the Notifiers API um, is very, very simple. You just have to implement a Ruby class that looks like this. So in the constructor, in this initialize method here, um, it just needs to accept a bunch of options. And in the notify method, uh, which is called when we need to do the act of notifying, uh, it just needs to accept a bunch of options as well. And within that, you can do whatever you want. So in this particular case, it's just obviously an incomplete SMS notifier. But you can see how you would set up the variables so that you could call out to whatever notification system you want. 
And that gives you an incredible amount of flexibility because it means that we're not making uh, the projects, the flapjack project itself isn't making strong decisions about the way that you're going to be doing notification. And the API is simple enough that you can sit down, work out how you're going to do it, and write your own notifies yourself if you care about that. The other cool thing is there's a lot of power uh, that you get out of this uh, out of this notifier API. So here are some example ones that I haven't written yet, but are definitely in the back of my mind. So you can use, uh, we, you could potentially create a mock NRP backend where um, you have Flapjack uh, fake itself as being uh, an NRP client. So it means that you can basically hook Flapjack into your existing NARGEOS infrastructure and use uh, Flapjack itself to run all the checks and be very performant like that, and NARGEOS to uh, send out the notifications if you care about that. Um, the, next, uh, uh, the next cool notifier that could potentially be written would be an elastic notifier. So I don't know, how many people here use Puppet? Okay, that's a fair number. How many people here use Chef? That's sad. Um, so. <laughs> so uh, there's another little project that sort of bolts onto the side of Puppet and Chef called M Collective, and uh, M Collective is basically a mass system orchest uh, orchestration tool. So what M Collective does is it actually hooks into the uh, Puppet resource abstraction layer to do things like install packages and run scripts and you know set cron jobs and all, all the sort of thing that you can do within. Um, your manifests in Puppet, or your recipes in Chef. Um, and the cool thing about it is that it bolts uh, an XMPP client onto all the machines that you want to manage. So when you want to, say, I don't know, upgrade all the machines, um, that you, or half the machines in your data center to the latest version of SSH, instead of logging into every single one of them and doing that, or using some other you know, crazy SSH in a for loop solution, um, it will hook directly into the Puppet layer, the Puppet resource abstraction layer, to do that operation for you. So you've got this XMPP client and are running on all the machines that you're managing, and you send out a broadcast notification to it to say, okay, upgrade to the latest version of SSH, or whatever the package is that's got the security vulnerability. You can do exactly the same sort of thing in Flapjack, potentially, where you write an elastic notifier that what, what it will do is it'll look at the current running state of Flapjack itself. So if it notices that uh, Flapjack is running behind, there's a number of checks that are backed up on the queue that need to be executed, it can send out to M Collective to tell, say, a, a bunch of machines that are just sitting there idling, uh, waiting to run these extra checks that, hey, you should totally start up to new Flapjack workers now. It means the system, to a certain extent, becomes self-healing, and you can scale that up and scale it down dynamically, which is sort of cool. Uh, the final potential uh, notifier that could be written would be a very boring reporting one that might post it out to some uh, you know, HTTP API over REST or SOAP or whatever crazy thing you, you guys want to use. Um, and the nice thing about that is that uh, you can get a, a segmented view of particular types of statistics. So you can say, okay, I only, I'm going to write an, a reporting notifier that only uh, cares about you know, these particular types of statistics. And you can just discard everything else. Uh, okay, the next API in the Notify is the Persistence API, um, which sort of looks a bit horrible, but is sort of cool. Um, so you can write this thing called a Persistence Backend, and a Persistence Backend basically abstracts away a data store, whether that be uh, SQLite, CouchDB, MySQL, any of those different things. Um, and it implements this API that allows Flatjack notifiers uh, to poke at this data store, this persistence layer. Um, without knowing how things are configured behind the scenes. So all you have to do, uh, if you want to write a persistence backend for, you know, say, MySQL or MongoDB, is you uh, implement these methods on a persistence backend. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of method signature stuff in the documentation. You can, you can go through the docs and see how the current backends are implemented. Um, and this gives us a tremendous number of advantages. Um, firstly, is subclassing. So let's say, hypothetically, you have a MySQL backend um, that is doing all this persistent stuff, right? And you've implemented all these methods. So you know, when a check comes in and we need to do some sort of notification and we need to look up in a database to see whether, you know, to check the current state of that check or the previous state or you know, check relationships or that sort of thing, um, MySQL backend is doing that for you. But say you find that, you diagnose that MySQL is the slow part in uh, your monitoring system and you want to speed that up. So because 
the MySQL backend is just a class in Ruby. We can actually subclass it. So we can do things like, when I get a check, look up that check ID in memcached. If we don't have a valid check ID for that, then we're going to call the super method, which is just going to call the original get check method on the MySQL class. And then that will return a check from the database. Then we update it in memcache, and then we return the result to a client. So that means that you can just throw in a uh, memcache caching layer or whatever other caching technology um, caching layer on top of your existing uh, persistence layer, which is sort of very, very cool. It also means that you can write uh, hybrid backends as well that um, say, uh, add extra logging or, um, or write out segments of data to different data stores if you want to do some sort of longer term performance analysis. But all of that is very, very easy to do with the Persistence API. Uh, the next thing that's really cool about having a Persistence API is serialization and deserialization of data. So the advantage of that is uh, you can talk to whatever Persistence backend you're using, whether it's CouchDB or MySQL or SQLite, and it will always return data in the same format. So it's just a Ruby hash or a collection of Ruby hashes or whatever. And that allows us to do very interesting things like migrations. So you can say, uh, in, so this is a Cucumber um, uh, unit test, or not really a unit test, it's an integration test, um, which if you guys are interested, um, I gave a talk about Cucumber a few days ago and you can go download the video for that. But anyway, what we're doing here is we're saying, given I'm using the SQLite persistence backend and I run a standard set of persistence backend checks, then I migrate from SQLite backend to the Couch backend because I've decided, yeah, I have too many checks in my system and I really need the extra scalability that CouchDB gives me. Um, and I run those same persistence backend tests again, then the result should be the same, which makes it very, very easy to verify that when I'm running on one backend and I've switched to another backend, that my monitoring system is behaving exactly the way that it was before. Very, very cool. Last, second last thing is the benchmark suite. Um, so it means that because we're dealing with this uh, standard uh, Ruby object, it's very easy to create uh, data sets to test the load of different persistence backends to see how they cope with different loads. So you can do things like, okay, let's create a, uh, a data set that's, say, 20% uh, critical checks that um, are failing very heavily, 30% uh, checks that are warning, and 50% that are okay. And you can run that. You can iterate all over all the different backends that you have. So you can see how SQLite performs, CouchDB performs, whatever. Um, you can also do other things like you know change those ratios to see okay, well when I have really really heavy loads. So you say you're in um, say you're in a very unreliable hosting environment where you have lots of machines that are failing all the time, and you have a guaranteed you know 80% checks are failing all the time. Um, you can see which backend is going to give you the best performance, and for the number of checks as well that you're running. So you know. Uh, uh, backend that is, um, you know, like SQLite, might perform very well for a small number of checks that are failing all the time. But when you scale that out, obviously it's probably not going to not going to work and perform as well. Where something like CouchDB might not be the optimal choice for a small number of checks um, that are failing all the time, but for a very large number of checks, it's a good fit. Uh, the final thing is web interfaces. The great thing about having a persistence API is it's very very easy to write web interfaces that don't care about the data store. So it sort of acts as an ORM layer. Um, and eventually, I'm going to build some stuff that hooks into it to make it, uh, the persistence layer appear more like uh, an ORM in Ruby. Um, but the great thing about that is you can use you know, one web interface for Flapjack um, and switch between the backends, and everything behaves the same way that you expect it to behave, which is very cool. OK, the last API in the notifier is the filter API. And this is probably um, the coolest new shiny thing that's in there that's actually probably the best thing about the project so far. So Flapjack uh, takes the approach that whenever we get result off the result queue, we should always be notifying, regardless of whether it's failing or it's OK or we're in downtime or whatever. So we have this concept of filters. And filters will look at a check that comes in um, and see whether uh, it matches a particular condition. If it matches that condition, then it will block so that filter won't happen. So, it, so the filter blocks the actual notification. So that's what, what this line here does, right? It goes through the list of filters, passes in the result that we've just gotten off the results queue. And if any of these block, then we won't notify. Very neat. So if we look at an example filter here that's bonded with Flapjack, we have this OK filter. And what that will do is it'll look at the result. And if the result is warning or it's critical, then uh, we obviously do want to notify. But if it's OK, it won't notify. 
Um, then we have this any parents failed thing. So if we go back to a few slides before on the systems back end, we have this uh, any parents failed method here. Um, and what that does is it's a convenience method for um, checking to see whether any, uh, any, any parent checks um, have failed. And if they have, then it will return a true. Um, so we obviously, we most likely don't want to notify if, you know, um, say the web server is down, um, sorry, the, uh, the host, host up check is failing and the web server check is failing. So we don't want to notify about the web server check failing because obviously the host is not. Uh, and that's very, very easy to do uh, with something like this, where there's any parents failed. So what that does is it just calls out at the persistence backend, and it passes the result to see whether any of the parents have failed. Um, and yeah, that's it. It works. Uh, the last thing is uh, of the Flapjack infrastructure is Flapjack admin. And that really shouldn't say release separately. It really should say uh, work in progress. Um, now that I've switched to the persistence API for doing all the interaction with data stores, um, Flapjack doesn't have uh, an, uh, an admin interface or a web interface for doing stuff, which really sucks and basically makes it unusable. However, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I am uh, working on the admin interface and there should be something um, workable uh, within the next week or so. So within the admin interface, um, we have a couple of concepts of nodes, check templates, checks, and batches. And a node is basically a representation of a machine, right? We have a check template, which is a template for a check. And we have checks, which are basically an instance of um, a check template with some node information thrown in. So it's basically you take a node and a check template and you scramble it together and you get a check. And then you have batches, which are collections of checks. And probably the coolest thing about that with batches is that you can um, say, okay, I have this batch ID of 31 or you know, it could be a timestamp or whatever. And you can run the populator and say, okay, I want all the checks that I had uh, administered in my system at this particular point in time um, to be running on the, flapjack, uh, on the Flapjack workers now. And it will just fetch all that stuff out of the database using the persistence API and inject them in. And it means you can get um, some form of version control over the checks that are within your system. It's sort of neat. OK, and the last thing about Flapjack is that uh, it talks the NARGEOS protocol. And this is, this is quite a big thing, and quite a big design decision um, made within Flapjack. And the reason that it talks to the NRGOS protocol is because there isn't a tremendous amount of point in reinventing the wheel, because you're just going to do it wrong. The great thing about NRGOS and the NRGOS plugin format, um, sorry, yeah, the NRGOS plugin format is that it is a formal interface. And formal interfaces are incredibly powerful when you're building these sort of distributed systems. The formal interface is if the check fails, exit zero, uh, the check is warning, exit one, check is critical, exit two. So good, bad, or ugly. And it will generally output it in this format, which is very, very easy for different parts of the system to produce and consume. So plugins are essentially uh, producers of this information. And it means it's very, very easy to write an RGS plugin. And that's why there are so many RGS plugins out there, because all you have to do is implement this very simple formal interface. And then the consumers, being the monitoring systems like uh, NARGEOS or um, any, any of the other monitoring systems that are out there, basically. And, and Flapjack definitely subscribes to that. It just works with NARGEOS plugins like there isn't a problem. And this really comes down to that whole no data collection when testing thing, doing one thing and doing it well. And the reason we don't do that is because there are plenty of other projects out there that do that data collection and do that execution of the tests that you want um, without any problem. And there's not a lot of point in reinventing the wheel there. So doing one thing and doing it well. And I posit that there are three different types of checks within the monitoring system that you're generally running. It might be a fourth category. But we have gauges, right, where you're seeing on system whether you know, um, we have this amount of used memory, and we want to see whether that amount of used memory is within this range, within this acceptable range. right? And you can do that very easily by using something like collectd to collect the statistics um, for you and then put them in one central location and just query that, rather than having agents, NARGEOS agents, that are out and collecting all that statistics for you. You can just use collectd, which will give you a huge amount of visibility over your infrastructure. And then you can just point Flapjack at it to get those statistics and do whatever testing it needs to do for you. And you have behavioral tests, which are things like Cucumber NARGEOS, which, again, I talked about a few days ago. Uh, and then you have trending. And quite realistically, there isn't really anything in the monitoring space that does this well um, other than uh, there's another monitoring solution that um, has been talked about a tiny bit in the last six months. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but um, coming in? 
No, something else. Um, starts with an R. I don't know. Just, yeah, that one. Um, and that does a, a whole bunch of really interesting trending stuff. But I, I think the trending is something that, not, uh, the, sorry, the flapjack is going to have to do um, to give you uh, that extra value out of your monitoring system. So very briefly, Qcom and RGOS allows you to run high level, sorry, allows you to write high level definitions about how, how services should be working. So saying, when I go to google.co.nz and I fill in the query form with Wikipedia and I press Google search, then I should see this particular result on the page. Um, Qcom and RGOS started out as being uh, testing for uh, integration testing for web applications, but now it's been a lot more genericized to do other sorts of system testing. So interacting with mail servers or interacting with DNS servers. So what you're actually testing is the behavior of a system rather than the way that that system itself has been implemented. So you don't really care about the configuration format as long as the system is doing what you expect it to. And then you run that, and then that will give you a bunch of output here, and then Qcom and RGOS itself outputs all this information in the RGOS plugin format. Then you have CollectD, which is probably what we're going to, well, it's not probably, it's what we're going to be talking about for the next few minutes. So CollectD is a lightweight statistic collection daemon with an emphasis on collection. It's network aware, so it means you can collect statistics on one machine and send them to other machines without any problem. Uh, it has a plugin interface, so very easy to write plugins for, um, for different types of systems that you want to monitor. It has a huge list of plugins, you know, over, I think over 80, um, for, for all the standard low level statistics, but also the, the larger things like uh, this curl JSON one, right, that can talk to CacheDB to get statistics out of that. And then you have disk for looking at disk I.O. Um, you've got exec for just calling out just random shell scripts if you're going to go that way. Um, Java ones for looking at JMX, low-level JMX statistics. Um, there's just, just a huge list. And if you want to know about that, um, you should go to the Collecti web page because the documentation is just amazingly great. Um, the final thing about Collecti is that it has a Collecti Nargios bridge that allows you to poke at those statistics that you're collecting. So what you can do is you do Collecti Nargios, the plugin that you care about, and the host that you care about, and that will return in the plugin form, in the Nargios plugin format, whether it's within that range that you specify. And there's actually a, a warning and a critical flag that you pass it, and you, you pass ranges and whatnot, and it'll give you all that information and do that computation for you for free. Very, very, very neat. So we look at some example collect deconfiguration. Um, this is the way that you would tend to be running Flapjack on your infrastructure in a combination with collect D. So on the collect D client, which is the server that you want to collect statistics about, um, we're saying that we want to collect statistics every 20 seconds, and these are all the plugins that we want to collect uh, statistics for. So we have the CPU plugin, the DF disk. You can see all those there. The nice thing about CollectD is that it provides a lot of that configuration for you by default, so you don't have to actually specify anything. It will just know what to do and collect those statistics for you. So we have this network plugin, and what we're saying here is for all the statistics that we collect, we want to send them upstream to a machine called monitoring.mydomain.org. And if the machine at the other end doesn't receive them, so be it. But you have a bunch of ways of getting around that. Uh, so on the collect server side, we're saying that we have this network plugin and an ROD tool plugin. Now the network plugin is listening on that address, and for all statistics that come in, they should be written out using the ROD tool plugin to valid collect the ROD. And under that, this is whole hierarchy um, for hosts and plugins and plugin instances and that sort of thing. And the cache flush is the important part of this configuration. We're saying that we want to hold on to the statistics for 900 seconds, and after that 900 seconds has passed, then write them out to the disk. Otherwise, um, you're going to be completely pounding your server with a whole bunch of random writes over the disk, which is okay if you've got, say, a solid state. But when you consider the vast amounts of data that you're probably going to be collecting with collect D, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And you can do other cool things like a forwarding server where you have like a multi-tiered collect D architecture where you know, you're collecting statistics on a bunch of um, forward-facing web servers and then you're aggregating them at one data center. And then uh, on the forwarding server, you can actually uh, do matches where um, you will discard information that we don't care about and then send that upstream and then you run your monitoring system against that. That's very cool. Uh, the other cool thing is uh, a bunch of language bindings for CollectD that implement the CollectD network protocol. So there's jcollectD, and what this does is it collects uh, full st uh, JMX statistics on this my main class here. And you basically load this into your class path, um, and it will get all those JMX, JMX statistics on that particular class. And you can attach it to whatever class you care about. There's Erlang CollectD, which is just insane but awesome. And then there's Ruby Collect as well. And probably the coolest thing about this is this with full proc stats. So what we're doing here is we're saying connect to the server, 
send statistics every 20 seconds, um, and we want to collect all low-level statistics from the Ruby VM and report them up to collecting. And we'll just do all that for you. The nice thing about that is if you're using Ruby quite heavily, um, you might be using Ruby Enterprise Edition, which gives you a whole bunch of introspection stuff um, about how the VM is performing, and all, that st all those statistics will just magically become available to it uh, to collect it. Do you have a question? Holy crap. Okay, so, okay, the future and how you can help. Um, packages, Flapjack is distributed as a Ruby gem, which is really ghetto. Um, we should have packages which are in the works at the moment. Um, give us about two weeks and there will be packages for all your distributions out there and it will be rainbows and ponies. Um, nice graphs, the web interfaces don't really exist uh, at the moment and we want to integrate uh, something like Visage, which I'll talk about at a lightning talk later on. Uh, job insertion API for uh, getting stuff out of whatever the, the how you defined your checks and into the populator. So that let, lets you do things like a check definition DSL where um, you can write in just pure Ruby how you want your checks to be defined rather than a web interface, which is sort of cool. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Um, I just want to ask you if you have any plans to <clears throat> integrate with other monitoring systems like Zavix or uh, Ganglia or some of the other ones? Because it seems like you've written more of a monitoring construction kit than a monitoring system. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a fair comment. Um, right now, uh, you could quite easily consider Flapjack to be the infrastructure in which you build your monitoring system with, but it's not going to stay like that for very long. Um, originally, it started out as being uh, just a crazy prototype, and now it's becoming a lot more stabilized. So integrating with other monitoring systems and other data collection agents is absolutely a top priority. Have any other questions? Uh, very quickly, what was the presentation tool? Nobody ever asked me about the content of my presentation. This is what I use. Um, I have a blog post about this. Uh, come and find me afterwards if you want to know about it. Um, but it's crazy and you shouldn't use it. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, oh, uh, it's called Impressive, but there's a bunch of other infrastructure I've written around it to make it work nicely. <laughs> right, thank you, uh, everyone. If you could put your hands together and thank Lindsay for his talk. <laughs> thank you, Lindsay.